Yeah, I can stand for him because he stood for me. Amen. Turn to 2 Thessalonians 2 with me tonight. And uh, chapter, chapter 2, verse 1. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letters from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved for this cause. God shall send them strong delusion. Yes. That they, should not, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in righteousness. Father, bless your word. In thy holy name I pray, amen. Now, has anybody in this house tonight uh, have, any, have a problem understanding the seriousness of Second Thessalonians 2? I mean, you know, all Scripture is not uh, directed in such a serious fashion as this. This is serious business. Very serious. And uh, it's talking about the rise of the Antichrist. It's talking about the power of Satan. It's talking about deceit on a grand master scale. So it's something that we should take to heart and we should be, we should be, we should be aware of our surroundings. You know, as they say, the old timers used to say all the time, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And it was very true. We can't help being here. We're here. And so, therefore, we should be observant. We should watch what's going on around us. Now, the state of Colorado and the state of Washington have just recently legalized marijuana. And then the president of the United States came out the other day and made a statement that's kind of, let's put it this way, uh, in a sort of agreement uh, with, uh, with certain aspects of it, just put it that way, kind of uh, set it in perspective. But the whole state of Colorado, where you've had one massive shooting after another, I got on the internet before I came over tonight and tried to run some references to find out uh, how many mass shootings they've had in Colorado. That's where Columbine happened in the, the Aurora Theater, some other places. A lot of people have died in Colorado at the hands of shooters, killers. And uh, Washington State. So these two states have legalized marijuana. Now I wonder what that means to the inmates locked up now throughout the rest of the country for trafficking in marijuana. How they feel about that? And when they say, "Well, let me move to Colorado then, or Washington," what it does is create confusion. But I want you to look at a greater picture. That's what this is about tonight. We all know the problem with drugs. We know where drugs lead people. And, uh, but I want you to look at a greater picture. The reason I read 2 Thessalonians to you tonight is because it, uh, it, it gives you a perspective of what to look for. And it's not that it's coming, it's here. 30 years ago, I used to preach about the stuff coming. I don't preach about it coming anymore. It's here. We're living in it. We're living in it. And so uh, we need to equip ourselves and, and be able to help others and direct them because they need direction. Marijuana. On the carcinogenicity, carcinogenicity, in other words, the carcinogen capability of marijuana smoke. Marijuana smoke contains carcinogenic hydrocarbons, 
Cannabinoid administration promotes cancer under certain laboratory conditions. Lesions similar to those caused by tobacco smoke are found in the bronchial epithelium of marijuana smokers. Marijuana tar produces tumors when painted on the skin of animals. The best evidence to date on the link between marijuana and cancer, however, derives from large case control studies, especially population-based studies. Such studies tend to suggest, if anything, an inverse association between marijuana use and cancer. In plain words, there is a direct link between the use of marijuana and cancer. A lot of different types of cancer. And the thing about cancer is that uh, down through the years I've observed uh, cancers like each other. They're connected, they're connected. So Colorado legalizes and Washington State legalizes marijuana. Let me let's give you two testimonies tonight. These are firsthand testimonies. This is from a woman named Edith. She says that I felt that I was more fun when I was drunk. Soon after I started drinking, I was introduced to marijuana. Later, I was hanging out at a friend's house smoking marijuana when someone pulled out a bag of cocaine. Snorting cocaine quickly became a daily habit. I was stealing money from my parents' business and from my grandparents on a daily basis to support my alcohol, cocaine, marijuana, and LSD. <coughs> then I was introduced to OxyContin and began using it on a regular basis. By the time I realized I was addicted, snorting OxyContin was part of my daily routine. I needed something stronger and was introduced to heroin. I would stop at nothing to get high. My addiction was winning. Every time I tried to kick it, the physical craving would send me back for more. I noticed six distinct progressive steps in this woman's testimony. Step number one, she started with alcohol. Step number two, that led to marijuana. Marijuana is what's called a gateway drug. Step number three, she started snorting cocaine. Step number four, she had to support her habit, so it led to stealing, thievery, burglary, bank robbing, whatever necessary. Uh, and step number five, she said she needed something stronger. It's not enough. It progresses. On and on and on it goes. She wound up with heroin. She'd stop at nothing to get high. Her addiction was winning. And then step number six, every time I tried to kick the habit or kick it, the physical craving would send me back for more. She was addicted and enslaved because she was a slave now to that. Here's another testimony. It started with weed, then the pills, ecstasy and acid, making cocktails of all sorts of drugs, even overdosing to make the rushes last longer. I had a bad trip one night. I prayed and cried for this feeling to go away. I had voices in my head. Put that in the back of your mind. Had the shakes and couldn't leave home for six months. I thought everyone was watching me. I couldn't walk in public places. Man, I couldn't even drive. I ended up homeless and on the streets, living and sleeping in a cardboard box, begging and struggling to find ways to get my next meal. Then, notice the voices in the head. Notice the, notice the introduction of an of a alien spirit. Pot, weed, marijuana, hashish, or what do you want to call it, has been used for centuries in worship. Most people startled to find out that every major pharmacy in America offered cannabis tinctures as medicine until the 1930s when cannabis prohibition began the U.S. Now, the 30s is the middle of the, of the uh, Great Depression, 1929, the stock market crashed. Cannabis has been used for over a thousand years by most, world's, most of the world's great cultures as a medicine. Most people in the West are unaware that many ancient cultures also recognize the value of cannabis as an aid to spiritual practice. Now we're going to make some connections. Like any powerful medicinal plant, the energies of the plant must be used in a way that harnesses its basic properties to promote health and healing. When used correctly, it can have a profound enlightening effect. For this reason, sex within Tibetan Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Sufism, 
and a variety of other religious groups have used cannabis for spiritual practices. Below is a brief overview of cannabis spiritual history compiled through various textual and online sources with a focus on ancient spiritual practices. We've made a connection now. It's no longer just simply a recreational drug, something that uh, a lot of kids experiment with. And all kids don't go to heroin when they start with uh, marijuana. No, I'm not saying that at all. But there's a whole lot more to it than just uh, than just a drug. This drug in particular, marijuana, has been around a long time. And it's been used and is still being used in worship services, in spiritual enlightenment, to draw one closer to their God or gods or their spiritual experience. Don't you think it's quite remarkable in this country that uh, something like uh, 45, 50 percent of all the kids in the school system have tried marijuana? That's the figure. And that may even be low. Did you know that? Because a lot of times they're not honest when they do their surveys. That when you go to a school system in this nation, that you are introduced by peer pressure and so forth. If you're going to be cool and you're going to be part of the crowd, you're going to smoke dope. That's just part of the culture. The bottom line is that the American culture is a drugged culture. But you see, it's not just simply limited to drug addiction. It opens up something within the individual. Drugs put you in an altered state of consciousness. When you're not directly controlling your, your thinking faculties and your spiritual uh, 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 demeanor, drugs allow you to go deeper into certain areas that you shouldn't be in. And this is a well-known fact. This is why they use it. Could it possibly be that they're drugging the, co the population of this country to prepare them for something? You suppose that's possible? Listen to this testimony I got from a man in Hawaii. He's in Hawaii. And he sent me this a few days. He's come, he's, uh, he sent me now. This is about the second or third communication I've had from him. And he, want me to, he wanted me to know this. I'm not going to read all of it, and I'm not going to give his name. But he's very articulate. This is one of the best written that I've ever gotten. And I've gotten some wild stuff. Man, I'm telling you, folks, I get some stuff that blow your mind. This is not wild. Listen to this man. For the last 10 years, we have lived in an incredibly New Age, neo-pagan, ground zero here in an area of the Big Island of Hawaii, that is a genuine living remnant of the 60s. Hedonistic drug culture that is alive and well, that openly, proudly, and arrogantly embraces Christ consciousness, religious coexistence, Rastafarianism, homosexuality, goddess worship, witchcraft, shamanism, polygamy, westernized Hindu practices such as yoga, kundalini, marijuana worship, Pyote, Ayahuasca, psychedelic uh, ceremonialism, and on and on that sincerely believes it will bring heaven to and peace on earth. Not so long ago, we too ashamedly embraced some of these beliefs and practices, which was the reason we were originally attracted to move here. But as a couple of years ago, have found ourselves miraculously born again in the midst of this madness and now find ourselves at war with the very same principalities we once embraced in testimony to the darkness we've been delivered from, which is quite astounding to witness the shunning from our former pagan acquaintances here who now treat us as a contagious leper with a display of absolute open hatred of the biblical Jesus Christ, who they believe stands as a direct barrier that must be eliminated from the face of the earth for their spiritual evolution. As we openly witness to the redemptive power of deliverance from the grips of the demonic forces of the new age, as an example, we are often met with incredible hatred in response to our testimony and online statements 
with the help of your influence and teaching guidance of the Holy Ghost, to warn other to flee such as this. Did you get that now? You know, tolerance, coexistence, until you're not one of them. The New Age coexist religion, and he has it in parenthesis, coexist. You've seen the, the, the uh, bumper sticker. The New Age coexist religion is the religion of the New World Order, New Order of the Ages, that caters to self, personal divinity, leading into the blasphemous belief that man can be his own self-made God, capable of his own redemption. The very same deception the serpent Satan used in the garden, resulting in man's fall from paradise. The New Age teaches man can find his own way back through his own self-defined stairway to heaven, bought through his own self-defined righteousness, pure Luciferian doctrine that appeals to the ego openly welcoming the kundalini serpentine energy to snake its way up the spine into the consciousness overtaking the mind and claiming the soul, calling itself Christ consciousness, which is nothing more than a blasphemous antichrist counterfeit. If you are not following the biblical Jesus Christ, you are following Satan. It's that simple. Repent and believe or perish. Awake, O sleeper. And then he quotes 2 Thessalonians 2, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, if this man's only been saved two years, <laughs> two years, folks. Now, I don't know how much Bible knowledge he had beforehand, but there's one thing for certain. He has spiritual discernment, big time. Because there's a whole lot of pastors in the churches in this country that don't know half of what he just said. They live in la-la land. Just goody-goody, feel good, love everybody, and it's all going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. The ship's going down now. But the fact that all of these different types of religion can find a common ground and that there seems to be an underlying theme that connects all of them together. And they on the surface may disagree on certain points, this and that and so forth, but when the Lord Jesus Christ, bless the name, is introduced, He is a pariah to them. What does that tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ? <laughs> what does that tell you? He's not of them. He's not of this world. His spirit is not their spirit. They don't know Him. Well, what about the Christ consciousness? That has nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. The word Christ itself is a, is a term that may not refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ means the anointed. That's the Greek word for the Hebrew Mashiach, the anointed. The anointed could be the anointing of a, a cult anointing that's coming upon them. A Christ consciousness when they're lifted their spirit up into the universe, into the heavens, and become one with the universe in meditation, and realize where they came from, and all this Mickey Mouse junk. But the bottom line is, that the Lord Jesus Christ that we preach, the Savior of mankind, that has nothing to do with self-righteousness. For He, you remember how, you, you know why that I, I harp and hammer and preach all the time about the only righteousness that has any meaning whatsoever is the righteousness of the Son of God that He earned by His perfect sinless life. 2,000 years ago on this earth. That's the only righteousness that has any meaning whatsoever. And that righteousness is my righteousness because He applies it to me. He has become unto me my righteousness, made into me that righteousness. Not that I earn it, I can't earn it, not that I deserve it, but that's what He gives to us because we're born again. So that drives us to our knees in humility because we can't earn that. We can't be good enough for it. And as far as being conscious of Christ is concerned, Christ is in me the hope of glory. But it's not up here in my head, it's down here in my heart. For if the true Christ comes into your heart, He's going to change your life. And you will be considered a leper 
and an outcast and not part of the show. Because once you are born of the spirit of the living God, you would be surprised at how so many of these religious people with crosses on their buildings will turn away from you. And the reason they do it because they are part of this new world religion. The religion of the new world order. Listen, the new world order doesn't care what God you worship. Just like the Romans didn't. They don't care about your particulars when it comes to your worship. The only thing they're concerned about is the fact that you are part of the system. You're part of what's happening. You're part of what's going on. And whatever it takes to pull everybody together, that's what it's all about. It's about pulling them together. Have you noticed how that homosexuality has become mainstream now? It's mainstream. It's not an aberration. If you want to bring the wrath of the news media down upon your head, you get up and say that sodomy is a perversion. And they will immediately come after you. You know why? You've kicked one of their sacred cows. That's what's happened. And so this right here is a scathing rebuke, but it's also an eye opener. That's quite a remarkable thing in Hawaii, folks. The great island down there in the middle of the Pacific. <coughs> Hawaii. The land that uh, the missionaries went to in the 1800s and carried the word of God and established mission work there and got many people born again. But look what's happened. This stuff creeps in. This is why it is so important to, to contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. It's not about how big you are. It's not about how pretty you are. It's not about whether you're accepted by religion or not. It's whether or not you're standing for the truth of the Word of the living God. I made a list of what he went through. And I'll go through them quickly. We've talked about Christ's consciousness. Then religious coexistence. We've talked about that. Rastafarianism. Rastafarianism is a, is, a, is a minority. It's a minor thing. As far as most people are concerned, they've never even heard of it. How many ever heard of it? Haile Selassie was the emperor of Ethiopia. And these people worship him as a god. That's what that's about. Haile Selassie himself uh, professed to be a born-again believer, professed to be a Christian. And that's just between him and God. You know, he, he probably has nothing to do with the fact he can't help it if somebody's going to worship him. But if he's conscious of it, he will rebuke them for it, just like the apostle did. In a heartbeat would never let a man fall down before them and worship them. But this is, uh, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm certainly no expert on this stuff, but that's what it refers to, the worship of Haile Selassie. Homosexuality is a, is a term that was created in a clinic somewhere in a college professor's uh, classroom, and he took two words and joined them together that didn't exist. Homolos means of like, sexuality, so hom homosexuality means of like, sexuality. What he means to say is he's a sodomite. The word in Hebrew means burning. That's what the word means. Go look it up. Sodomite means to burn with, 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 uh, with perverted lust. That's what the word means. And when you take the word in its descriptive term, you can't beat Bible terms. That's why they don't like Bible terms. That's why they're constantly creating new words for the vocabulary. You know, like your significant other. What's that mean? <laughs> what, another hound dog or... You know. Significant other. Of course you know what it means. They've, they've created a term to accommodate something. He's not your wife. He's not your husband. So what is he? He's my significant other. Pervert. That's what it means. <laughs> Goddess worship. Goddess worship starts, is, uh, the Bible's clear on it in the book of uh, Acts. They're talking about Diana of the Ephesians. That's goddess worship. Mother nature is goddess worship. The idea that you're going to change the gender of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from male to female, the whole idea is that you are turning upside down the truth. You're calling evil good and good evil. You're calling black white and white black up, down, down, up, cold, hot, hot, cold. Witchcraft, we all know what that is. Uh, shamanism, we know what that is. A shaman is one who's a spiritual uh, go-between, a, uh, a, uh, a, a kind of a holy gifted man who contacts both worlds. Polygamy is the multiplication of wives, more than one wife. Westernized Hindu practices. I wanted to do this and got tied up before I got in here tonight. But for your own edification, uh, he lists these things. He lists yoga, kundalini, marijuana worship, payot, and the other one that's a tough word to... 
ayahushka, whatever it is, psychedelic ceremonialism. Okay? Uh, when you get home, type the word yoga and type in, and, and type in uh, type, type, uh, church yoga classes and see what you pull up. You'd be amazed at how many churches are head over heels into yoga. That was just an exercise that's not yoga then. Yes, sir. What's he smoking in his pipe? It, it, he's not smoking anything. It's an imaginary Oh, point. oh okay. They're out of their mind. Oh, yeah. Okay. They, they are acting like they're taking drugs and drinking and they're drunk on the Holy Ghost. Okay. That's what they're saying. But that, I do you're talking about. It. Yeah, have you heard of that before? It's the most powerful hallucinogen on the planet. Okay. It's, it's, uh, I wonder if anybody had ever heard of that before. It's fine. Is that how you pronounce it? Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, yeah. Okay, the A is silent then. Ayahuasca, okay. It's used by the shamans to induce, uh, you know, a, yeah. a, a state of trance yeah. where that they can literally see and talk to uh, the spirit world. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, the American Indians, they smoked Paiute, Paiute or whatever you want to call it. And they did the same thing. They got off into this, into, this, uh, into this spiritual trance where they contacted the spirit world. But in any event, you've heard me talk at length about Kundalini Yoga, or Kundalini, the serpent at the base of the spine. It coils around, comes out the top of the head. The chakras, the power points through your body, all that stuff. We've talked at length in Sunday school about that. Marijuana worship. I wasn't able to find much about that. Does anybody know anything about marijuana worship? Marijuana as a as an aid to worship. This may be what it's a reference to. I don't think anybody's worshiping marijuana. But who knows in this day and age what they're about. <laughs> and then of course the peyote. But anyway, I would like to know how many churches are head over heels into yoga. And uh, you know it's just a, it's just an innocent uh, a, a innocent uh, form of meditation and what have you. And I, I read to you about a year ago what a, what a Hindu Swami said about yoga. He said, there is no way you can make yoga Christian. Yoga is Hindu. And it means to be brought into subjection to. You become a slave of. That's what the word yoga means. And so these people that are sitting there in the, in the lotus position and they're, and they're quoting their mantra and here they are in, in, in practicing yoga, they just think it's so innocent. The American public amazes me at how naive people are in this country. They really are. They're very naive. I guess because they're Americans, they think that they can, they can just do anything, say anything that they please. They don't realize that they're messing with ancient stuff. This stuff has power in it. There's power in words. There's power in symbols. There's power in this stuff. And so it's going on. And then the New Age Coexist religion is the religion of the New World Order. So the next time you see a coexist on a bumper, first time I ever saw one, I said, that's not my thing. Because I recognized all the symbols on there. And it was a matter, you've got one symbol, you've got, you've got one word that unifies all these different religions. It's like yin and yang. South Korea has yin and yang on their flag of South Korea. You take a circle, you got one circle. Here's a circle. In the circle, you've got this. You've got a female and a male. One's black, one's white. They are opposite of each other, but they balance each other in the circle. It's the idea, therefore, that you have good and bad. You have this and this that counteracts each other to produce the whole. And that yin and yang is a very powerful uh, occultic symbol. And you find it everywhere today. It's like the Ankh that you saw in the Egyptian Ankh when they carry it. You see it in the hands of the pharaohs and all them back centuries ago. They'd have that Ankh. It's a round circle like this comes down. Then there's a cross. Okay. That's the Ankh. All right. It is a perversion of the cross. It's like the upside down peace symbol. You've seen that? Okay. 
What in the world would break the cross upside down and make that peace? Peace is the person. He is our peace. See, everything the Old Testament looked forward to to be accomplished is all in a person now. Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. So what Satan does is cause you to focus your attention on a object or a thing or, an, or some kind of an accomplishment and the New Testament focuses you on a person. Christ said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Yeah. If you want to find out whether the person you're talking to is a real Christian or not, I'm not interested in whether they're a Baptist or a Methodist. That's meaningless. That doesn't mean a thing. If you want to know whether they are a real Christian or not, you start talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who's God Almighty manifested in flesh, who's seated at the right hand of the Father, who's coming again in power and great glory, and He's able to save to the uttermost all that come to God through Him. And that through His precious blood my sins have been washed away, I've been forgiven, and I'm a born again believer. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus our Lord. And His name is above every name, above every God, above everything there is. There's only one name given among men whereby we must be saved. And that's the name of Jesus. There's none greater than Him. Do you agree? <laughs> well, my Catholic church teaches this, or my method, I don't care what your church teaches. What about Jesus? Do you agree? And if you don't agree, then you are part of this modern philosophy, this modern uh, unified religion, and you're headed down that road for destruction. And folks, I'm telling you right now, the Baptist church is headed there too. Thank God for those that aren't. And there are many that aren't. Thank God. And Methodist, and Presbyterians, and so forth and so on. And Greek Orthodox, and Russian Orthodox, and Armenian Orthodox. Not the whole church, but many in it that love the Lord Jesus. And they're, going, and they're headed the right way. Do you know the Lord Jesus tonight? Man, something like that ought to be, it ought to be uh, shocking for this man to write that. And they're talking about uh, praying about moving back to the states. He left Indiana, somewhere in Indiana, Kentucky, and they moved down there. They went down there because of the of the atmosphere, because of the environment. But they're talking about coming back up here now because they have little in common. You know, I don't know if they found a good Bible believing church. I don't know anybody know anybody in Hawaii. Do you know Do you know of a Bible believing church in Hawaii? A church they can go to? I don't know. I don't know much about Hawaii. I spent two weeks there when I was in the military. I was headed to Okinawa, and they had a typhoon off the coast of Okinawa, so the plane couldn't get in. So we were forced to stay in Hawaii for two weeks. <laughs> hey, <Lord. laughs> That's the truth. I'm not lying to you. I wouldn't get up here at the pulpit. We were forced to stay in Hawaii for two weeks. <laughs> it rained every day for about five minutes. For about five minutes, clouds just this beautiful place, folks. It's something else. <laughs> but I was unsaved then too. That was in 1965, a long time ago. I didn't know anything. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't even. I don't even know if I knew about uh, Pearl Harbor then. I didn't know Zip. And uh, if I had, I'd, I would I'd no doubt have visited that and seen that Arizona that's uh, sitting down there below the water. But anyway, God rescued me too. Hallelujah. He rescued me, folks. He did. He reached right down into the darkness and spoke to my soul. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Never met this man, but I say, that's my brother. I like his spirit. That's the truth coming out of him. Amen. All right, I'm done. Our brother mentioned Gary Silvius to you. Keep praying for him. I talked to him today, and he's got...